Yo, what's up? This is Jason D, host of The Wise Up Show on 88.1 KZSE Santa Cruz, and uh, currently host of co-host of the Wednesday Rec with Casio and Tommy Gotti on 90.9 KHDC. Uh, I think my first earliest uh, hip hop memory would be uh, watching uh, Grand Mixer DST uh, cutting up uh, Rocket for Herbie Hancock. And really for me that was something I had never seen before. I actually saw it on TV first and uh, he was cutting up that Bad Five Freddy, you know, fresh. And uh, to this day actually I think the, the routine he does on that record, um, it, you know, still uh, stands on, it, on, on its own. I got into DJing, um, really, you know, uh, hip hop for me got really big when I was like kind of the age 13, 14, so 83, 84, and uh, that's a very rebellious age for teenagers. Um, the whole anti-establishment message along with that, uh, I was into, kids in my school were all break dancing, I was never really good at that, uh, so I started uh, taping all these uh, mixes off the college radio show. Got to give a shout out to uh, Carlos Diaz, Night Sounds, very famous uh, Bay Area college DJ. Uh, Kevy Kev uh, from the drum on Stanford and uh, others. So basically I, I, I used to listen to people who did a show kind of like me. Uh, and then I met some older kids when I got to high school that had turntables set up in their garage. So uh, uh, Greg Nye, not Greg Nice, but Greg Nye, <laughs> my man Javier Dominguez and my man Ricky Castellanos, they had a, a DJ crew called Live Creations DJs. They really didn't have any idea what they were doing. Uh, it was Radio Shack mixers, belt drive turntables, but every day after school, we go over to um, Javier's house. His dad let him set up all the t six turntables on the workbench, and we would just take turns trying to do what we had heard, like Herbie Hancock do and other people on the radio. And uh, that's really where I got my start DJing. Was kind of a, a, a garage DJ. So basically, the evolution of my my DJing went like this. You know, in high school, I would just do kind of guest features. I knew the guys that DJed the high school dances, and I'd get on there and scratch for a few minutes. And it was such a crazy thing people look at you like whoa you know um, but I really didn't uh, hone my skills until uh, later when I uh, quite by accident met the Prince of Charm so um, the Prince of Charm was a DJ in Northern California but he was a member of Uncle Jam's army and at the time he was winning uh, all the DJ battles he had won like 26 DJ battles in a row something crazy like that and he was often featured on Kevy Kev's uh, radio show The Drum and so one day my mom has this friend over from work and um, she's asking me what I'm interested in and I'm telling her I like DJing. She said, oh, my son's a DJ too. And I said, well, you know, what's his name? And she said, the Prince of Charm. Well, I, I lost it. I mean, it was like, man, that was like my idol at the time. He was running things on the radio. And she's like, oh, he would love to help out, you know, kind of an up and coming DJ. So uh, we made plans to get together. Uh, he actually helped me buy a mixer and some other stuff, um, you know, kind of elevating away from the Radio Shack equipment. And at that time, getting a Gemini mixer was like a big step up. He had to go to the flea market to get it, but uh, he kind of did the negotiations for me and all that. And then unfortunately, uh, a couple weeks later, he died. He actually uh, fell asleep at the wheel um, coming home from a DJ battle in Stockton and, and crashed into the back of a semi. So it was this huge tragic thing for um, early Bay Area hip-hop DJs. And um, I went to the wake, and at the wake, uh, and actually there was a tribute concert that was headlined by Egyptian Lover, Rodney O. Joe Cooley, Uncle Jam's Army, like that, that whole scene. And I went uh, as, a, as a guest with his mom, and she said, I want to introduce you to someone uh, who he was teaching how to DJ also. And it's a girl, and it was actually a big secret because there was no girl DJs in the battle scene. And his whole thing was he was training her to be a battle DJ so she could come out and run things and then be extra crazy because she was a girl. And so she introduced herself to me as the Princess of Charm, spinoff from the Prince of Charm. And she said, well, since he was teaching you, uh, I'll go ahead and teach you uh, what he's taught me. You probably know the Princess of Charm as DJ Pam from The Coop. We spent a great uh, summer together DJing every day, uh, learning lots of those tricks. And then I moved to uh, Santa Cruz to go to college. So after that uh, summer with DJ Pam, uh, I moved to uh, Santa Cruz to attend UC Santa Cruz. One of the reasons I, I chose UC Santa Cruz as a college was first of all, it was close, I lived in San Jose, um, but also they had a radio station. And so I instantly wanted to figure out how I could get on that radio station. Um, and ironically there was this woman named Lisa who lived in my dorm who had a show up there. She played like soul, like uh, Bobby Brown, New Edition, that stuff was really popular at the time. Um, but she let me make little 15 minute mixes on cassettes uh, that she would play during her show. Uh, she introduced me to this guy named uh, MCE, uh, who is also known as Eric Arnold. He used to write for The Source. 
Uh, he's still, I think, a hip-hop writer. And uh, he had a show called Down By Law that was every Friday from 2 to 4. Um, I began to do uh, guest DJ sets on the Down By Law show. I also very quickly met another guy at the station named Ronnie P. Now, Ronnie P. Um, hosted a show called The Wise Up Show that was on every Saturday. And he played a little bit of everything R&B, but he was from Compton. So he was playing like a lot of King T uh, and, and just sort of, you know, real regional L.A. music. Um, he, there was actually a guy before him that did the show, I think his name was Khalil, um, that actually named it the Wise Up Show. And uh, he had that on his license plate, uh, Wise Up, and it's actually spelled W-Y-S-E-U-P. So th th there is some history there that I don't fully know, um, but I didn't actually name it the Wise Up Show. Um, unfortunately, uh, Ronnie P fell into uh, financial hard times and had to go home. So um, it first started off where I was kind of guest DJing on all these different shows, and then when Ronnie had to uh, return home, this was in the um, spring of 89, uh, or actually even, yeah, spring of 89, he had to return home for financial reasons. I took over the Wise Up Show, and, uh, and that's how I became the host of the Wise Up Show. How did the Wise Up Show evolve uh, as far as, you know, becoming known for sort of the underground hip-hop? Um, you know, basically I moved to Santa Cruz from San Jose. Uh, growing up in si San Jose, uh, it, was, it was very common that people would listen to, like, what we call Latin hip hop, high energy. Uh, I think now they call it freestyle, but it's like the Cover Girls, um, more you know, kind of up tempo. Um, you know, and a lot of it coming out of New York, honestly. Um, but then they would also listen to Rodney O and Joe Cooley. Uh, at the same time, Egyptian Lover was really big, the L.A. Dream Team. But then you also had coming out of New York, you had Rakim, EPMD, Boogie Down Productions. I mean, all in this sort of late '80s time period. And it was very common in, in San Jose for, that people would listen to all of those things and all of those things together. And so that's really what the early Wise Up show for me was carrying on what was sort of popular at my high school. Um, not uh, too long after taking over the Wise Up show, um, uh, a local producer came up to the show and, and um, DJ named Cutmaster Kurt. And uh, Cutmaster Kurt was really the one who, you know, sort of opened my eyes up to say, hey, listen, um, I really like what you're doing with the show. Uh, the stuff you're doing with Rakim, Steezo, EPMD, Boogie Down Productions, that sort of thing, King T, they can't really hear that anywhere else. But the stuff you're playing, like the Nocera, the uh, Rodney and Joe Cooley, Summertime, Summertime, and you know, all those kind of club joints, people could hear that other places. And so, why don't you try and focus on, you know, having a show that represents more, uh, you know, the underground hip hop that can't be heard other places. So, to this day, I really credit. Uh, my early meeting with Cutmaster Kurt is kind of shaping the sound uh, of the Wise Up show and, and really getting me to think what's important about radio, I mean, in particular college radio or community radio, and, and that's really how I took on that mission that you know no matter how good it is, if it's getting played somewhere else, then I don't need to play it. My job is done. My job is to break the next thing. And that's really how, um, in, in my opinion, the Wise Up show really got focused on underground hip-hop and uh, playing stuff you couldn't hear somewhere else. My relationship with Cutmaster Kurt continued to evolve. He was my connection to Santa Cruz. I was his connection to the university. Um, I began to DJ a lot of dances at the university, and, and eventually uh, we ended up doing things in town as well. Uh, I was a frequent DJ at the Red Room, for example. But through Kurt, I began to meet a lot of local MCs and DJs. And uh, the first project he brought up to me was Red, Black, and Green, which was a San Jose-based group, very conscious, like uh, Public Enemy. But the next group he brought up uh, to play on the show, uh, I actually uh, was very excited about, and uh, it was MC Groove, and that was probably the first uh, Santa Cruz record I ever played on the Wise Up show. So the uh, MC Groove project became uh, instantly a favorite up at the Wise Up show, and I actually got it on a lot of other shows up at KZSC. The interesting thing about that is you almost have to have some history on 12-inch singles or records or EPs at that time, because um, there were some different what I almost call styles that people were doing. So one of the things about the MC Groove Project that was very interesting to me is they very consciously tried to make a, a record for each type of, type of audience. They had a song called, you know, I think it was called Way Back in Time or something about Back in Time. Uh, I think my man King Caesar B was on the scratch on that one and uh, TMF may have done some production on that one. Uh, and then they had kind of a, um, a Miami bass kind of song that was uh, much, much faster. Uh, and then they had the, this is for suckers, which came in like it was a, uh, not a Rodney O and Joe Cooley song, but it was that sort of tempo, it was a little faster hip hop. So they really tried to hit, you know, um, 
you know, sort of all the, kind of the different genres. I mean, at this point in hip hop, there's a billion, but at the time there was kind of slow hip hop. There's kind of Miami bass. There's kind of more, you know, fast stuff. So um, I thought that was genius. There was something on the record for everybody. I think the fact that he took the picture, you know, down at the boardwalk and everything. Um, there was actually a lot of support uh, for MC Groove on um, on that record and in fact I know Kurt and I ended up doing some shows with him I think we did a, an MC battle where he performed at and uh, just overall I was really proud to be associated with uh, that MC Groove project. So the expansion of hip-hop radio beyond the wise of show. Um, KZSC at one point in time in the early 90s was very hip-hop friendly. We had the Down By Law show with MCE. Like I said I took over the wise of show with Ronnie P. Uh, not too long after me, we had um, The Grinch, who uh, did a hip-hop show. We had Junkie J, who did like breakbeats and funk and hip-hop. Um, not too long after that, uh, we had DJ Echo uh, with the Underground Railroad. I mean, there, there just really has been a lot of support for hip-hop uh, shows on KZSC. At the same time, there was, you know, a, a, a few stations going on across the Santa Cruz uh, Bay, for lack of a better word from us. You had KUSP that had you know, um, some teenagers doing some stuff. Uh, the Verbal Tech was getting his start on uh, Kazoo, uh, eventually moving to KHDC, bringing on Cutmaster Kurt, uh, then bringing on Casio, eventually Bond Production showed up. I mean, there was just a sort of a point, I don't remember the exact date, but you know, sort of the mid 90s where you could listen to an underground hip hop show every single week. And the thing that was different about it, like you listen to radio now, they're always competing and arguing with each other. We were all friends, so it was like, I go on there like, all right, tune in tomorrow and listen to you know the Verbal Tech, and then he would say, hey, listen to Jason D, and Cassie would say, listen to Jason D, and we cross promote everything. For us, it was really about the music and trying to expose it to as much people as possible. And to this day, that doesn't exist anywhere, and really for me, I think we took it for granted. But you know, you could listen to you know uh, two or more hours of underground hip hop a day in the mid '90s in the Central Coast, and. I can't think of any other place uh, where that where, where, where that ever happened. So my uh, my favorite memory of the Wise Up show that's a tough one because there's so many. Um, I'd say probably one of the uh, the crazier things that happened is Cup Master Kurt began working with Cool Keith, and uh, we had him up there and uh, you know had him freestyling. Uh, that was always legendary. But I remember one time he called me from New York. Um, just kind of random and he said he was on the corner on a payphone and that he was driving around with dead bodies in the back of his pickup truck and that uh, he couldn't you know he couldn't talk very long he had to he had to go because he had to you know uh, dispose of the body so there there was also characters that were kind of like that that were kind of in and out of uh, the wise of show cool Keith was certainly an extended fam uh, there was quite a few people who also um, knew people or went to school with people uh, at the wise of show so dilated people came up uh, to the station quite a bit. Uh, there was this guy Voodoo who um, just kind of he was dating a girl from there. He was really kind of down with Razzcast and some other people. Really obscure underground hip hop. I'm sure his records are selling for a lot right now. I mean, he came up before. He really tore it down. Uh, and then there was this kind of this cast of characters that hung out. My man Scott Z, my man uh, uh, Joe, uh, my man Temp One, my man James. Uh, so many people. Uh, Casio, of course, uh, you know, really Casio uh, honestly met him first uh, originally promoting records, so he was kind of running a record pool and he came up and eventually just uh, was such a personality, he just stayed on with the show and, uh, you know, really, um, you know, really helped anchor the show, you know, with me. And then uh, we got the crazy idea one time, I think inspired by Howard Stern's movie, and I'm not really sure why, other than just to do something different. But we decided we wanted to get a female co-host, and we would have a, auditions, right? And uh, we met a lot of interesting people through that process. But uh, to this day, the, the person who stood out uh, was Zammy, Zammy D. And I mean, Zammy could talk about hip hop. She could talk about sports. I mean, she, it was she was like, you know, she knew about hip hop and she watched Sports Center. Like we couldn't even keep up. Uh, to this day, we stay in touch. But I mean, some of the best sort of. Uh, Debates and comedy on the Wise Up Show definitely took place between uh, Jason D. Casio uh, and, and Zami. So, um, you know, a lot of good memories, hard to pick one, but uh, I would say every week we kind of made it up as we went along. I think that's the other thing, uh, if I could just add on, is radio today is so scripted. I mean, people are told what to play, whatever. I mean, we literally, like, you know, an hour before the show, we'd grab a bunch of records. 
throw them in a crate, we get up there, and we just start talking shit, basically, and then whatever, like, we started talking crap about, typically other rappers or whatever, that was it, it just happened, you know, and we just made up as we went along, and I don't know, in some respects, maybe that's what we was, uh, you know, refreshing about it, I don't know, but uh, a lot of good memories on the Wise Up show, so thanks to everyone who listened. All right, so the, the demise or the end of uh, the Wise Up show. Uh, you know, straight up, uh, I can't be more than direct than this. There was a guy named Aaron Wade who had a, ra ha had a show at KZSC. And uh, honestly, he just started doing a lot of snitch stuff. Like, if I played a record that let a curse go, he, he reported it. Um, the guy just had a lot of issues with me. It's really, it's really, it was really the first time I really experienced hating. So he, he reported me in a, a, a few different situations where I was like, dang, you know, I'm playing some real hip hop, and you're also doing a hip hop show, but you're turning me in because it played a curse or whatever. Uh, then we had a situation at a nightclub uh, where KZSC T-shirts were used in promotion uh, with a giveaway that wasn't authorized. And uh, to be honest with you, at that point, that guy had a position of power at the management. Um, Casio and I actually caught him sleeping at the station one night. And so, like, he was using his position to sleep at the station. So anyway, I, I don't normally air people out like that. But when I look at, like, things I could go back and change or redo, like, man, that guy just really, he, he really had it out for us. And so um, I, I ended up in, like, three or four situations that I had to, had to defend. And it really came down to me against this other guy. And he was a manager up there, and it was very clear they just didn't want me at the station. And and so, long story short, what they did is they said, okay, well, we can't, uh, you know, basically we can't agree with your situation, but so we need to suspend you for some period of time. So they they kicked us off the show for a quarter, said we couldn't DJ up there, and uh, then we came back, we fulfilled all the terms and conditions that they gave, and then they said the schedule was full. So so essentially people this is a hip-hop but we got jerked you know for lack of a better word uh, so at that point Casio was like hey my home is your home uh, I began guest DJing on uh, the Wednesday rec on 90.9 and I've been there ever since and uh, you know uh, it, it, it's just it's one of those things where the Wise Up Show had a great run uh, but you know being Santa Cruz they are hypersensitive about what you play actually funny story I mean, they probably play this in elevators and dentist office now, but I remember playing Digital Underground, the Freaks of the Industry, and the station manager coming in, flipping out, like, cut it, cut it, pull it off, you know, uh, like that was just like, you know, pushing the envelope to some level uh, that, that listeners couldn't tolerate. Keep in mind, all my listeners are college kids, right? So, anyway, you know, anyway, so the demise of the, uh, the Wise Up show really came down to station politics, people hating, and uh, was, it, we just had to go, man. We had to go. But we keep it strong at the wreck. Man, so what am I up to now? Uh, so if you're on the Central Coast, you probably know I still uh, mix every Wednesday on the Wednesday Rec show with Casio and Tommy Gotti every Wednesday 6 to 8 on 90.9. And really taking advantage of um, technology to do that. About six years ago, uh, through a job opportunity and really a quality of life opportunity, I moved my family to Boise, Idaho. So uh, for the last six years, I've been uh, recording my show uh, in a home studio, recording a mix actually in my home studio, sending it out uh, through file sharing websites and whatnot for Casio and Tommy to talk over and uh, you know, really taking advantage of technology. At the same time, when I moved to uh, Boise, there is a community station being launched. It's called RadioBoise.org. I don't know, you know, the average person probably isn't very familiar with uh, what's involved with getting a license to start a radio station, but it, it, it took many, many years. George Bush had radio stations on shut down. You couldn't get a new one for uh, most of his reign. Um, and I'm happy to say that in the past year, uh, we, we received authorization to be 89.9 KRBX. And uh, right now we're through the, going through the process of, you know, government gives you some funding. The people in the community match that, and you know that's how you kind of double your money. So we're going through this process of raising money, and we should be on the air in spring of 2011. In the meantime, we're just an internet radio show. Um, but man, you know the music industry has really changed. In order to promote yourself, you guys know this. You got to be on Facebook, MySpace, you know all these different places. So 
Uh, check me out, myspace.com, djjasond, facebook.com, djjasond, twitter.com, djjasond. I do my best to post up the playlist and, and links to the mixes every week, so um, stay with me. We're still doing it. I mean, the game's changed, technology's changed, but honestly, the rules of the game haven't changed. We're going to play underground hip-hop, we're going to play stuff that you can't hear you know, anywhere else, because uh, once that happens, our job is done. And uh, we're just going to try and play, you know, what we think is the best representation of the music. We don't care about any advertisers. We don't care about any radio stations. We don't care about playlists. We forget to do them half the time. We're, we're still doing the same thing, which is, man, just having fun playing the music we love. So, hopefully you, you still love it, too. Now, how I met Jason D. Actually, I was a fan of his. He's going to get a kick out of this. I used to listen to his show every Saturday, you know. It was good. I mean, he really played, he had a nice show. Hey, I give it to him. You know, he had a really nice show. And he played a lot of underground hip-hop, and he knew a lot about what he was playing. So I listened to his show. I was at the TV station, and I said, this guy would be a great guest for us to be have on my um, TV show, on you know, this rap video show. So I called in. We made arrangements for us to come up and shoot him. And, um... The rest is history. We got off, we kicked it out, we, we, we hit it off really well and everything. But a little antidote on the side. My wife was with me. Because <laughs> she used to be the like the downtown Julie Brown chick. <laughs> that was her role. And I was thought I was Fab Five Freddy. So, you know, that's the kind of thing we used to have going. And so she said, um, so Jason shooting and everything like that. And we never told people who we were married at shoots. We never did. So, um, we working for a few minutes, waiting for a few minutes, and then all of a sudden, people are moving into another room. Jason taps me on his shoulder, said, come here, come here, I want to ask you something. He said, yo, who's the blonde chick? <laughs> he went, I said, oh, yeah, huh? That's my wife. <laughs> no, I probably didn't say, that's my wife. I probably said, um, you know, I think she's married or something like that, because we never used to, to tell people, you know, we never said nothing about it, because it would it'd be off-putting, you know. They, nobody wants to really... You know, although some people didn't give a shit, but anyway, <laughs> me, me being one of them, <laughs> I would, I don't know. Actually, when I found out somebody, um, that's somebody's spouse, I, I, I raised up with. That's how I met Jason. We, all, we got along for, what, 20 years, man. And Barney Rubble was there when we got there. So that's how I met Barney Rubble. Yeah, he sure did. And then, now that I think about it, that's who inter um, definitely introduced me to Cutmaster Kirk. All right? Jason D, great dude. Met him like 10 years ago. Used to be a fan of his um, back in the late 90s, 2000, 2001. Uh, used to listen to the show. Um, used to cassette record all the shows back in the days. Uh, great dude. Met him when I first started coming up here. Before I was part of the show, just come visit. Have a bunch of artists that would come up here. So he was really friendly back then. Still friendly guy. Travel with dude for for a few years. Um, he's the kind of friend that uh, you could stop talking to him for like a year, see him a year later, and just kind of pick up where you left off. Uh, great dude, Jason D. So in 1989, when I had put out that first record with Red, Black, and Green, I was of course promoting to the local radio stations, etc. And uh, I was up at KZSC at the radio station with a friend of mine, Eric K. Arnold. He later became a writer for The Source and other acclaimed magazines. But uh, at his radio show, he also introduced me to a guy who had another show or was an up-and-coming DJ at the station named Jason D. And so me and Jason D started hanging out immediately after that. We were DJing parties all, all over the campus in Santa Cruz, whatever, and uh, drinking way too much Old English. He had a mullet. My man Scotty Z was like, yo man, cut off that mullet. And uh, he had plenty of uh, boils on his neck from drinking too much Old English. I probably did too. Jason D was one of the DJs that I, li I started listening to through KHDC as well. And um, he's someone that really brought the skill of DJing, mixing, and scratching, and backspinning. And, and uh, he had a, a really talented way of putting his mixes together. Um, some of his mixes actually sounded like they were pre-recorded, but they were live. So Jason D really stepped up the game when it came to what us as DJs um, were looking to do in terms of, of our skill of a DJ, because he definitely he is dope. Um, you know, being connected to people like Cutmaster Kurt and Casio you know, automatically gave him instant uh, credibility. But his skill level as a DJ is what I remember the most. Um, 
and uh, you know, tr listening to what he would do and try to do the same thing and or try to figure out how he was doing it. Um, once again, at this time when we heard a DJ DJing, we would only be hearing it. We wouldn't have any visual at all. We couldn't go to YouTube and type in how to scratch or how to transform or how to backspin. We were just listening to it and we had to figure out just through um, hearing it how to do it. And DJ Jason D is one of those DJs that we would listen to and try to mimic. Um, Jason D, um, I met through Kurt, and he was, uh, um, this was before he had his residency on KCSC, but um, he was a friend of ours, and we all hung out. And uh, I think by that time, I mean, we had all kind of gone our separate ways stylistically. I wasn't really as involved in hip-hop. You know, I always thought of Kurt as being more the, the he's like the Marine. He was like the Marines, the, you know, always, what is, what is their, their uh, slogan? Um, you know, always, always faithful, sempre fidelis, whatever it is. So um, I always think of him as that, and I, I kind of veered off a little bit, and I got more into punk rock and everything, and uh, I still, you know, I still kind of musical, you know, uh, just kind of enthusiast. But back to Jason D. I think, um, yeah, he was kind of him and Kurt were like peas in a pod, in a way. You know, they really were. Jason D, Jason D, Jason D, Jason D, Jason D. <laughs> you know, I can honestly say, you know, I've worked with a lot of, you know, great people throughout my radio career. Um, as far as being parts of, of the shows I've been involved with and whatnot, but I can honestly say with, you know, all due respect to everybody, Jason D is hands down the best radio partner I've ever worked with. Um... Jason and I just click perfectly, you know. I, I'm the I'm the wild out guy, you know. You know, I don't take no shit from nobody, and I'm gonna tell you to your face. And uh, Jason's more of like the, you know, um, let's just all calm down. Let's all, you know, we can come to a commonality, common, you know, uh, uh, common ground, and solve this problem. And uh, it's it's just it's just it's great, man. Some of the times we had the wise up show were just beyond beyond words um you know when zammy came in when zammy d was part of the wise up show uh that added to it and we had some great times on the air at uh, at the wise up show so um and you know continuing on now you know jason's still part of the wednesday wreck and uh you know we've we've been through you know great ups and great downs as far as radio has gone but um you know that that's my brother right there so uh you know nothing but love nothing but respect for jason d and um i know he's still doing his thing up at krbx up in uh, boise idaho you know boise idaho boise idaho hip-hop in boise idaho leave it to jason d to bring hip-hop to boise idaho but he's damn sure doing it and uh it's just another market that team heineken is dominating yeah, uh, like I like I mentioned in the past, uh, it, it 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 takes an army, and then, uh, you know we have we have a uh, KZSC Jason D loyal to that program. I know that when I would tune in on the weekend, he'd be there, and uh, he be he he would be doing the university, and I could always count on on like I said, I'm radio's biggest underground fan. You know, I'd always be listening in. And uh, uh, he'd always amaze me. Uh, he was doing what, what, what we all were doing. We were one big army. Uh, KZSC, Jason D, uh, following closely with, with, with Kurt and all the fellas. Uh, max, master mixing, uh, live mixing at the parties. Always always heard about the good, good things he was doing. And uh, we, we, we talked well, quite a bit. We, hear, we talked throughout the years. But uh, we, we we knew we knew each other's uh, aim, you know. We, we we knew that that he had a mission to do, and I had a mission to do. And we kept it, you know. We we kept pushing for 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 always bringing the masses music that they needed to hear, that they were not going to get nowhere else. They were not going to they were going to get it. Uh -uh, they weren't unless you went up to the Bay Area. Oh, Jason D. Oh my. You know what, I think this is how we met, I think this is how we met, at that time, 
you know, I helped put together Gavin's first rap radio chart, and his name was on that list of reporters for Gavin uh, magazine, you know, a, a hip hop college radio reporter. And if I'm correct, uh, um, I called him up, told him I was going to be in the Bay Area, and we had a friend in common, King Shamik. And King Shamik uh, was part of that group, Twin Hype. And I think, if I'm correct, I first met this guy, not knowing he's a white guy, <laughs> but but this guy knows and knew his hip hop to this day, and we just hit it off real well. And I think uh, the first time we kicked it was in the Bay Area, uh, Rodney and Joe Cooley, and I believe they weren't even on Nasty Mix Records yet. We didn't sign them yet, but we were going to a car show, and they were performing, and. Um, yeah, and, and, and that's where we, we actually kicked it to the Rodney and Joe Cooley concert, and uh, we've been friends ever since, you know, from the Gavin days to the Hits days to now at RapAttackList.com, so I've known him for, uh, God, either almost 20 years now, you know.